Hello, uh, here in section 5.1 we're going to discuss the limit of a function. So what precisely do we mean? What is meant by the limit as x approaches c of f of x is actually equal to l? Well, let's try to formalize this similar, similarly to how we did sequences in the last chapter. So if we want to say that the limit is approaching l, then l should be kind of the output of the function, kind of lying around here. Right? And what does it mean to say where x approaches c? Well, that would mean that c is kind of an input to a function, so that would be located somewhere down here. So if we want to say that we're getting very, very close to an output l when we get close to an input of c, then what we kind of mean is that if we could make a little window around l right here, let's say up a little bit and down a little bit, and then we were to come over to the function and go down to the x-axis, then kind of what we wish we could do is set up a new window around here and if we could say that anything that we ever took a functional value of in this little window around C, if no matter what when we took function values of those points, if they always fell within this window around L, then that must mean that we get pretty darn close to L, right, as points get very close to C. Uh, notice in the picture here I did use an open dot because technically the definition of limit is not going to require that there's actually an output defined at C. We're going to be doing it on a deleted neighborhood and that's why a lot of our definitions are going to involve accumulation points in deleted neighborhoods. But effectively what we want to try to do is get really 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 close to a value, right? So if we get really 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 close to an output of L and then that's going to mean that given any positive number around L, any little window I can make around L, I should be able to find a little window I can create around C that's going to get me within that window. Okay, so let's formalize this. Now if we let F be a function from some domain D to R and C be an accumulation point of D, uh, this accumulation point requirement is just to make sure that we have infinitely many points. So it's not an isolated point in the in the domain here. It's actually like a point that has a lot of points that are around it. Every deleted neighborhood has a point. So we will say that the real number L is a limit of F at C if, well, let's say if for all epsilon greater than zero, if for every single epsilon greater than zero, there is a delta greater than zero such that we can determine and set f of x minus l, the distance of f of x from l to be less than epsilon, whenever we are, know that x is in d, so x definitely has to be from the domain of the function, but in addition to that, when we are very, very close to c, so I'm going to say when the x values distance from c is made less than delta. So if we go back to our initial picture now, what I'm essentially doing around these little windows is I'm letting these upper and lower bounds, the window around l is going to be l plus an epsilon and l minus an epsilon. So for any epsilon greater than zero, I can make a little window around L such that I can find a delta. So now the delta is going to come down to this axis, and that's going to be a C plus delta and a C minus delta, such that whenever I get my X points being somewhere in this very, very small interval around C, if whenever I take functional values of those limits, I always fall within the epsilon window. And that's what this is formally saying now. So it's kind of aligned with our sequences. Our sequences, remember, were infinites. We kind of went off to infinity. But I'm, the idea here is just to do it on a, on a graph with an x and a y coordinate. So let's do a simple example first. Let k be any real number in the world and define f uh, from r to r, so on the whole domain of real numbers, to be defined by x simply goes to k. So in other words, this is what we often call a constant function, right? Constant function k. Constant function. Okay. Now for any c, my claim is for any c in r, limit as x approaches c of f of x is always going to be equal to what of course? Well the function's outputs are always equal to k, so this limit should be k. Okay, 
remember our definition is for all epsilon there exists a delta such that this condition happens whenever this condition happens. So this right down here is an, an implication whenever this is my antecedent, antecedent and then this will be my consequent. Okay, so this will hopefully help me to be able to prove that the limit is what we say it is. Okay, so since the definition was a universal quantifier over epsilon, our first line is going to have to be something like, well, let's let epsilon greater than zero be given, because our statement's supposed to be true for every single epsilon in the world. Then we have to show that there exists a delta, so we're going to have to choose a delta. And so I'm going to choose delta in this problem to be equal to one. Uh, as you will see when we complete the proof here, it actually, delta could have been absolutely anything because this is a constant function, so it actually is fairly simple to see what happens at the end here. Okay, now I am going to assume, what are we going to assume? We're going to assume that, well, we don't really need to worry about x coming from d because our domain is all of real numbers here, but we're going to have to assume that we can take x minus c and that this is going to be less than delta. Because we want to know that whenever that's the case, whenever x minus c is less than delta, we're hoping that we can show f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Well, notice that if x minus c is less than delta, then that means that we actually have x minus c is actually less than one. So we're within one unit of c here, wherever c is. It doesn't even matter what c is. But now notice that when we try to make the proof now, we'll say notice, because we're actually proving something, we'll say f of x minus l is equal to, well, f of x is the f constant function case. Well, let's start off with like this and say, well, let's take f of x and subtract off our supposed limit, which is k. Okay, no sweat. Now, Notice that f of x, since it's the constant function k, this is equivalent to saying k minus k. But what's k minus k? Well, that's zero. So this was actually true not just for x minus c less than delta, or x minus c less than one, but it's actually true no matter what, that zero is going to be less than epsilon, because epsilon greater than zero was the object that was given. It was already a positive number. So since we showed that f of x minus l is less than epsilon, or more specifically f of x minus k is less than epsilon, we get to conclude that the limit as x approaches c of f of x is actually equal to k. Okay, so for my students here, keep track of this very carefully. This was an epsilon greater than zero being given and then we had to make a choice here, and we chose delta to be equal to 1. Then we made an assumption, not an n big, bigger than or equal to capital N this time, but we're making an assumption about where our points are on the x-axis getting close to. And then we had a statement where we had to prove something. So we're putting our g cap on here, and we're performing this proof. Okay, so let's try this as another practice problem. So with practice problems, you might wish to pause the video and try to take a shot at this on your own. But on this problem, we are going to let f of x be the linear function with the slope of one through the origin. So f of x equals x for all x in R. And this time we're going to fi try to find the limit as x approaches c of f of x. And since the function is the identity function, uh, putting whatever I put in, we would expect that the limit would of course be c, as we get very very close to c. Okay, so pause for a moment, take a shot at this on your own, and see if you can do it. But assuming that you've taken your shot and tried this out, let's try to do our own formal proof. Well, before we do a proof, maybe we should do a little bit of discussion, eh? Okay, what do I really want to happen? Well, I kind of want to get that f of x minus the limiting value. I'm kind of hoping that I can show that this is less than epsilon. Under the condition, so when, what was true about my delta? Well, when x minus c happened to be less than delta. This is just going back to the definition of limit. We want to show f of x minus l, but l is c, is less than epsilon 
whenever x minus c happens to be less than delta. Okay, remember f of x is just x, so actually I kind of want to see if I can make x minus c be less than epsilon when x minus c is less than delta. Well, what a coincidence here. I want to make sure that x minus c is less than epsilon, but I'll know for sure because I'll be assuming that x minus c is less than delta. So this seems to indicate that if I want to make a good choice for my delta here, the delta bound seems to be provided by the epsilon. So I think I'm going to choose delta to be equal to epsilon. Okay, this does not a proof make, here makes the proof. Let epsilon greater than zero be given. So now we have our epsilon. Choose delta equal to, after our discussion here, we're going to choose our delta to be equal to epsilon. Now let's make an assumption. Let's assume that we're really, really, really close to c. So we're going to assume that x minus c happens to be less than delta. What can we notice? Well, notice f of x minus the limiting value of c is literally equal to, well, f of x is x, so this is x minus c. And what's something that we know is bigger than x minus c? Well, by our assumption, we can see that delta is bigger than x minus c. So I'm going to put a delta there. But we chose our delta. What was our delta equal to? <gasps> Epsilon. So we've shown that f of x minus c absolute value, the distance of f of x from c, is less than epsilon. So that means that the limit as x approaches c of f of x is indeed c as we needed. Again for my students here, there's our given, let epsilon be given. Here's a choice, we're choosing delta to be equal to epsilon. Here's our assumption, which was the bound or the condition that was on delta that we get to assume for the antecedent of that uh, conditional. And then finally, the last line is really the place where we prove. But our discussion let us know that this was probably going to work. We got things nicely lined up so we knew that they were going to work. Okay, let's try a middle level example now. So this one's not going to be quite as easy as the other one, but maybe the line of logic will still make sense. Uh, we're going to look at f of x equals 3x squared minus 5x minus 2 over x minus 2 when x is not equal to 2. And since this top expression is undefined at 2, we'll just choose an, a value and say that the function is equal to 5 when x equals 2. Okay. This is the standard piecewise function where actually this value doesn't fill in the hole correctly. So this is a removable discontinuity that's going to cause in the graph that's going to cause in the graph. Okay, well let's take a glance at what's going to happen here now. So our f of x is equal to, in general, most of the time, it's equal to 3x squared minus 5x minus 2 over x minus 2. But that's equal to 3x x over x minus 2. And if I'm going to factor this, I'm going to need numbers that probably multiply to 2. Let's try a minus 2 and a plus 1 to try to match up with the bottom and let's see that gives us a minus 6 and a plus 1. Good, so I did my algebra correctly earlier on. This is the function that we're getting and after some simplification it looks like this is coming out to be 3x plus 1. For x not equal to 2. Notice that this is not the case for when x equals 2. But that means that since the function is almost always equal to this 3x plus 1, then we would kind of expect what? What do we think the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x should be? Our simplification is indicating that it should probably be 3 times 2 plus 1, or 3 times 2 is 6, so 6 plus 1 is 7. That seems to be what's happening here. So we want to try to make a claim 
that the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x is 7. But what would we need if we were to show this? by our definition. Right? Our definition has certain requirements. It has that implication. So let's move over here and say need when, need when, need when, need when. What do we need? We need f of x minus l to be less than epsilon whenever x minus c is less than delta. So remember f of x is over there and there's our delta or there's our f of x and our point that we're moving towards looks like 2 and our output seems to be getting close to 7. So what do we need when we replace with our actual function values? Well here we're going to have a 3x squared minus a 5x minus a 2 over an x minus 2 subtracted by the supposed limit that we said was 7 we really want this, we need this to be less than epsilon whenever x minus 2 is made less than delta because remember our c is 2, the number that we're approaching in the subscript here is 2, so that's my c and there's my l, and there's my f of x Okay, simplification. We actually performed the simplification on the previous slide in order to work this out a little bit. So I know that this reduces to 3x plus 1 minus 7. I kind of hope that can be made less than epsilon when x minus 2 is less than delta. Don't forget to pause this after every line and see if you can figure out what the next line is going to be. And then you might be pleasantly surprised when we get to the end. Okay, simplify a little more in here. Looks like 3x minus 6 needs to be less than epsilon when x minus 2 is less than delta. Okay, that's still okay. We can do that. Right? We can simplify by pulling out a 3, in fact. And we want 3 times x minus 2 to be less than epsilon when x minus 2 is less than delta. So we want well, 3 is a positive number, so I can just call this 3 absolute value of x minus 2 less than epsilon when x minus 2 is less than delta. And finally, dividing both sides by 3, it looks like I need x minus 2 to be less than epsilon over 3 when x minus 2 is less than delta. <gasps> wow! x minus 2? x minus 2. Delta, which is the thing we get to choose in terms of epsilon, which is the thing we are given. This seems to give us a good choice for the delta. Maybe we'll choose our delta to be equal to epsilon over 3 and see if that works. Let's give it a shot. What's the worst that can happen here? Let epsilon greater than 0 be given. We need to make a choice now. We will choose delta to be equal to, well after that discussion it looks like we're going to choose delta to be equal to epsilon over 3. So choose delta equal to epsilon over 3. Okay, Then we have to assume the antecedent of that conditional so we'll assume that x minus 2 happens to be less than delta. Okay. And then what happens? Well, f of x minus l, the function minus the limit, the distance of the function from the limit, is by replacement from the definitions 3x squared minus 5x minus 2 all over x minus 2 minus 7. Here's why it's important to be an accumulation point, because I can't use the number 2. I need the distance from 2 to be less than delta, but I need all of these points in the accumulation point to make sure that I'm getting infinitely many points that are actually not 2, because I don't necessarily need to hit 2. Okay, so what is this equal to? This would be 
After simplification, we already verified that this would be 3x plus 1 minus 7, which is just simply 3x minus 6. And again, I can factor out that 3. Remember, I did all of the work already. So I know that this is going to work out fine. And that's just equal to 3 times absolute value of x minus 2. Now the inequality part. What is something that you know is bigger than x minus 2? Well, delta is bigger than x minus 2. So I'll leave the 3 the same and put a delta here. And this is a strict inequality because of the assumption that we made over here. Well, what's something that's equal to delta? Oh, delta equals epsilon over 3. So I can come down here and say that 3 times epsilon over 3. But 3 times epsilon over 3 is just epsilon. So we ended up showing that this object here is less than epsilon. And so the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 is indeed equal to 7. Again, just for punishment or for practice, however you want to think about it, there's our given, there's our choice, there's our assumption, and here's the stage where we're proving the consequent of that conditional. That consequent of the conditional, again, is just the statement that our distance from L is less than our distance from L is less than epsilon whenever, so in other words we get the antecedent that the distance from delta is less than C in this case too. Okay, so we did a simpler example and then we did a kind of a medium level example. Let's do a pretty complex example. In fact I might even call this one painful. Okay, f of x, just a standard polynomial, x squared minus 3x plus 1 Pause the video for a second and think about what do you think the limit of f of x should be as x approaches 5? Well, assuming that you've thought about this for a couple seconds here, I would say that the limit as x approaches 5 of this function, just based on calculus knowledge, should probably be equal to 5 squared minus 3 times 5 plus 1. Right? In other words, it should be pretty close to 25 minus 15 plus 1, which is 11. So I think we can prove the claim that the limit of f of x as x approaches 5 will be equal to 11. Okay, nervous? Did I spill the beans because I said that it was going to be a painful example? Well, let's see how painful it is. Maybe it won't be too bad. But what would we need to show to get this? Right. What can I actually do in order to show this? Well, let's go over to the need whens again. We'll try to say something over here that'll be smart that we can figure out. So I'm going to skip over the f of x minus l stage and just go straight into saying what f of x and l are. So of course, our f of x was that polynomial, which was x squared minus 3x plus 1, that's the f of x, minus the limit, which we think should be 11. And I really want to show that that's less than epsilon whenever x minus our limit was going towards the number 5, so whenever x minus 5 happens to be less than delta. Okay, a little bit of algebra over here. x squared minus 3x minus 10 needs to be less than epsilon when x minus 5 is less than delta. Okay, nice factoring on this one. x, whoops, x plus 2 x minus 5 needs to be less than epsilon when x minus 5 is less than delta. Oh, 
So look how close we are. We have this part already. We have that x minus 5 less than delta, and this x minus 5 over here. So I kind of wish I could just divide by x plus 2 and get a nice thing that I can let be, let my delta be equal to. But we do have a bit of a problem here. It turns out this x plus 2 object varies. Right? It's got a variable in it, so it depends on x. But even though it depends on x, can it really get that big? How big can x plus 2 actually become? Actually become. Because I know that I'm going to be getting close to 5, so it's not like my numbers are going to be 117 or negative 23 or something wild like that. I'm going to be pretty darn close to 5. In fact, maybe if we just give an arbitrary bound, let's just choose a bound for the sake of argument here. So let's suppose that we made sure that x minus 5 was not too ridiculously far away from 5. We'll just let it be 1 away. So that's just a little inequality, of course. You can solve this by many means. But if we suppose that x minus 5 is less than 1, then that would mean that the distance from 5 would have to be less than 1. So I guess we would have that x would be somewhere between 4 and 6. Right? Make sure to do the algebra to solve that inequality on your own. I sort of treat it geometrically because it's a little faster for me. But I know that x has to be somewhere between 4 and 6. But that would mean, then that would mean, or that would mean what? So where would x plus 2 have to be? Well, x plus 2 would have to be between 6 and 8. Right? If x was between 4 and 6, then x plus 2 would have to be between 6 and 8. So I guess the absolute value of x plus 2 in this case would be less than 8, right? because all the numbers are positive. They're somewhere smack dab between 6 and 8. They don't get too far away. So it looks like we're always going to be stuck between 6 and 8. So we'll always be less than 8. But remember, there's a big assumption going on here, right? We said that x minus 5 was going to be less than 1. And I guess we could have technically put any number that we wanted there, right? Could have put 1,000, right? But we're going to have it be pretty darn close and make our calculations easy. So how does this affect our need-want statements now? Well, now we need that x plus 2. Remember, our last line over here was x plus 2 times x minus 5 less than epsilon when x minus 5 is less than delta. So we need x plus 2, x minus 5 to be less than epsilon when what? When x minus 5 is less than delta, then we would have that x plus 2 times x minus 5 would definitely be less than 8 times x minus 5 which we could then hopefully force to be less than epsilon. When, I shouldn't say want here, sorry, this was supposed to be a when. <laughs> when x minus 5 is less than delta, well, as long as x minus 5 was forced to be less than 1. Because remember, if x minus 5 was less than 1, that forced this inequality to be able to hold, that 8 was definitely bigger than x plus 2. See? That made 8 bigger than x plus 2 as long as this was the case. And notice that if that were the case, then we'd be set over here because then we could say that x minus 5 would be less than epsilon over 8 when x minus 5 was less than delta as long as x minus 5 was ensured to be less than 1. But now I have an idea for my delta. Ready? I'm going to choose delta to be, I from here, since x minus 5 is less than epsilon over 8 and x minus 5 is less than delta, we kind of wish that we could make our delta epsilon over 8, but this would only work as long as x minus 5 is also less than 1. So I am simply going to make sure that my delta is the minimum 
of those two numbers. So no matter what, x minus 5 will be less than 1, as long as delta is chosen to be the minimum of these two. And if you ended up giving me uh, some kind of number that was just like a really, really ridiculously large delta, well then I would just go epsilon over 8 if I needed to, right? So if you let me leave, if you told me epsilon equals 8 for some silly reason, then I would just make sure that I still use 1. Let's see if this brings us into a formal proof now. So let's let epsilon greater than 0 be given, then we will choose delta to be equal to what we found, the minimum of epsilon over 8 and 1. Right. Then we will assume that x minus 5 is going to be less than delta. Okay, so what does that mean? So, in particular, since x minus 5 is less than delta, we know that 1, x minus 5 will definitely be less than 1, so we can say that x plus 2 will be less than 8, as we discovered through our discussion just by doing the absolute values algebra. And we also know that x minus 5 will be less than epsilon over 8, because since we chose delta to be the minimum of these two, it'll be less than both of them. If the bigger number is epsilon over 8, then we'll just take 1, and then we'll definitely less than epsilon over 8. But if epsilon over 8 is small, which is what we expect most of the time, then uh, we don't need to worry about bounding 1, because epsilon over 8 is just really, really, really small. Okay, let's go see what we get now. Now, f of x minus l would be equal to x squared minus 3x plus 1 minus 11, which you can do the algebra on and see that this reduces to an x plus 2 and an x minus 5. But since x plus 2 is less than 8, this would be less than 8 times x minus 5. And notice that since epsilon over 8 is bigger than x minus 5, this would be less than 8 times epsilon over 8. Well, okay, technically I guess I should go like this. Let's be, we should go x. Technically I'm making the move here with the assumption, so I should say 8 delta. But then I would just say that that's 8 and at worst case 8 times epsilon over 8. And that's just equal to epsilon. But because of all my choices in the bound, I am getting that f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So the limit as x approaches what we're going towards, towards 5 of f of x, in this case is absolutely equal to the 11 that we thought it should be. Okay, so a little bit more painful, right? We got the givens here, we got our choice. The choice came from all of the discussion that we did beforehand. We have our assumption here that, like the sequences, we have a little bit of play that we have to do in order to make sure that uh, we control our bounds and make things as small as we need, but then we just have our proof statement and we put on our g-cap again. Okay, so that brings us up to the big theorem from this chapter that relates everything back to the sequences. So if we let f be a function from some domain to r, and c is an accumulation point, because remember we need infinitely many points in the domain that are pretty close to c, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals c if and only if <clears throat> for every sequence sn from d, so any sequence of values from the domain that converges to C with Sn not equal to C for any n, so we're going to make sure that we don't actually hit C, then we have that the sequence F 
Sn. So if we take the functional value of every term of the sequence, then this sequence is going to converge to L. Okay, so that's a mouthful, right? Really difficult to remember, I'd imagine, on an exam or something like that. So let's look at our picture over here and try to understand what it's actually saying. So in orange here, I'm going to draw a sequence that is from D, from the domain, that is going to C. So that might look something like there's an S1, there's an S2, a whole bunch of other terms, there's an SN, blah, 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 coming in towards C. So there's a supposed sequence that's uh, on the D, on the domain here, and it's kind of uh, crawling in towards C. Well, as I take the functional values of these, notice there's where f of s1 would be, somewhere over here. s2 would have to be somewhere like here, f of s2, dot 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 dot, and there's finally f of sn, sn's right there, f of sn. But notice what's happening to f s1, f s2, f s n. Well, if all of these points are getting arbitrarily close to C, then their functional values must be getting arbitrarily close to L. So the sequence, this infinite sequence that's going towards C, all of its function values will get arbitrarily close to L. And this is a huge theorem. This is so important, and it's going to be a great way to be able to prove so many things for the rest of this unit and the rest of the class, really. So, I think that this one deserves a proof. So, follow along in the textbook if you wish here, but when we go the forward direction, we're going to have this limit as our assumption, so we will assume, or suppose, say assume that limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to l, and that sn is a sequence that converges to C but is never actually equal to C. Never equal to C. So that's a boatload of assumptions here, but the assumptions are coming from we're doing the forward direction, so we're taking this as our assumption, and then it says in here, the second part is a conditional statement for every, or sorry, universally quantified statement over every sequence Sn that satisfies something. And what do we have to show? We have to show that f of Sn converges to L. That's really our big point. So we're going to try to show something converges. So what's a good first line, my friends? Let epsilon greater than zero be given, just like always. Then what do we know? Well, we know that the limit of f of x is equal to L. So, since the limit as x approaches c of f of x is L, we know there is a delta greater than zero such that f of x minus l is less than epsilon whenever x is in the domain of course and x minus the coordinate you're moving towards is less than delta. That was the definition of convergence, or the definition of the limit existing. Okay. We also know that Sn is converging to C. So since Sn converges to C, what do we get from that? We know there is an N, a capital N, such that for all N bigger than or equal to N, we have that Sn minus C can be made less than any number, including the number delta. So remember, now we have the epsilon being given, 
and then because of that epsilon we were able to find something that happens whenever we have this bound on the delta but now we're going to use this bound on delta to know that we have an n eventually our sequence has to get arbitrarily close to c in the domain so what do we get now this is going to be our final conclusion but then essentially for free for all n greater than or equal to capital N we have Sn minus C is less than Delta as we note right here and Sn is in the domain so that was our definition of convergence in the limit so f of Sn minus L on just these values, the functional images of those inputs that we're going towards C, we have those things are getting within epsilon of the limit. Because right? remember, f of x minus l was less than epsilon for any of these x's, and each one of those x's is now an Sn. We're only picking out the Sn's. So we have that f Sn's distance from l is less than epsilon, or it's heading towards l. So f of Sn goes towards L just as we needed. Forward direction done. Backward direction. So we'll do this by contrapositive. We'll start off with the assumption of not being a limit. So for this direction suppose that L is not the limit of f of x at c. Okay, so remember that definition of being a limit was a universal quantifier, existential quantifier implication, right? For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that x minus my distance from c being less than delta would imply my distance from l would be less than epsilon. So if we suppose that l is not the limit, what would that tell us? So, there is what? There is an epsilon greater than zero, because the negation of a universal would be an existential, such that for all delta greater than zero, because the negation of an existential is a universal, there is an epsilon greater than zero, such that for all delta greater than zero, we can find an x that is still in D with the antecedent being true, so we're going to have 0 less than x minus c less than, uh, that would have been less than delta. I'm just choosing it to be bigger than 0 now, so I'm uh, excluding the case where I hit c uh, exactly on, but remember we're assuming that C is an accumulation point, so if I do the deleted neighborhood, I can always find another point. It's not a big deal. And the negation of that consequent, which would mean that f of x minus L would have to accidentally be bigger than or equal to epsilon. Make sure to have that definition of limit next to this so you can see where I'm just negating the conditionals and the quantifiers that are in that definition. Okay, this is true for any delta, right? This is for all deltas. So in particular, in particular, for any natural number, for any natural number, we can define or find an Sn such that well, we're going to make sure that we're not equal to C, and we're going to make sure that we're less than a certain bound. Sn minus C is less than 1 over N. It's true for any N. But on the other end, we know that F of Sn minus L will actually be bigger than or equal to epsilon. So since it's true for all deltas, we're just choosing the deltas that happen to form a sequence here a sequence that strategically goes towards zero. So I'm making it infinitesimally small. 
By making it infinitesimally small, now we're getting what then? Well, this would say what? The distance from C of S of S sub n is getting smaller, less than 1 over n. So that would mean that Sn as a sequence must be converging towards C. But F of Sn does not go towards L because I made sure that the controls were going bigger than or equal to epsilon for any given epsilon. So I've forced my sequence to go towards C, but I found that I will not have my f of Sn's going towards epsilon. Sorry, my f of Sn's going towards the limit. They're always bigger than or equal to epsilon, so I cannot make them be less than epsilon. Your challenge might be to draw a picture to see what's going on with this. A picture is a great illustration to see what's actually happening here, uh, and 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 it would help you to really be able to dig through these definitions because you know intuitively what a limit looks like, but we're just trying to be formal with it now and seeing what's going on. Okay, so here's a couple fun facts. Uh, if it exists, the limit of f at c will be unique. Try to prove that on your own. It's an exercise from our textbook here, but it would be a standard assume that there's two and show that they're the same. Or you could do it by contradiction by assuming there's two distinct ones and then showing that you get a contradiction. Uh, another fun fact is that the limit as x approaches c of f of x will not exist if and only if you can find a sequence Sn in D such that Sn is never equal to c, just like we always require, we've always required so far, and Sn converges to c, but we can see that the Fsn's do not converge. On the other one, we saw that they don't converge to L, but in general, we'll see that the limit doesn't exist if we can show that the FSNs actually don't converge to anything. Let's use fun fact number two just for a little bit of a cool example here. Let f of x equal sine 1 over x and s sub n equal 2 over n pi. What is Sn? Well, Sn would be plug in 1. 2 over pi, plug in 2, 2 over 2 pi, plug in 3, 2 over 3 pi, 2 over 4 pi, 2 over 5 pi, dot 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 dot. Okay, so there is the sequence, and notice that since the denominator is always becoming larger, it's a relatively simple proof to show that Sn is going to go towards 0 here. But notice what is Fsn. Well, Fsn would be, first of all, it would be, since the function is the sine of the reciprocal of what we're looking at, this would be sine pi over 2, sine pi, sine 3 pi over 2, sine 2 pi, sine 5 pi over 2, dot 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 dot. And from trigonometry, we know sine of pi over 2 is, let's see, that's top of the circle, so that's 1, that's 0, that's negative 1, that's 0, that's 1, dot 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 dot. Right? So notice that this f of sn sequence right here, this does not converge. Does not converge. Converge, right? It keeps cyclically going through 1, 0, negative 1, 0, etc. So what do we get to conclude by fun fact number 2? Therefore, the limit as x approaches 0, because notice that this sequence is going towards 0, of sine of 1 over x does not exist. And this is a formal proof of that limit not existing, because I found a subsequence that went towards zero. Sorry, not a subsequence, but an actual sequence that goes towards zero. But the functional sequence, the sequence of the function values of that are, that are from each term of the sequence, does not converge. Okay, now. Using the big theorem, it is fairly straightforward to show the set of limit facts that you're used to from a typical calculus course. If f is a function and g is a function, 
let C be an accumulation point just to make sure our domain has enough points in it that are getting close to this one. And if K is any real number, if we define the limit as X approaches C of F of X to B L, and the limit as X approaches C of G of X to B M, well then you get a few things for free, right? For example, what do you think, based on your knowledge of calculus, is the limit as X approaches C of F of X plus G of X going to be equal to? Hopefully not too much of a shock here, but the sum, the limit of a sum, will be the sum of the limits. It'll be L plus M. How about a product? Limit as X approaches C of F of X times G of X. That will be the product of the limits. And how about the limit as X approaches C of some constant times F of X? Well, of course, that would just be the same old constant times the limit, which is L. And if in addition to these facts you happen to know that g of x is not 0 and m is not equal to 0, then you can do this for quotients too. Limit as x approaches c of f of x over g of x will actually be equal to L over m. But as per usual, this requires us to not have anything that uh, has a 0, causes a 0 in the denominator. Okay, these facts are all pretty straightforward. I think your textbook does sum, so as for fun here, why don't we try to do uh, the product one, number two. So, let Sn be a sequence in D that converges to C, but with Sn not equal to C for any N. Again, the standard definition, the standard assumptions we make about these sequences are that we're never actually hitting the value, but we're approaching it. And as long as we're dense, like we're in R or something like that, this is not, this is fairly, fairly obvious that we can do it anyway. Okay, but then what can we say? Then the limit of f of Sn is equal to L and the limit of G of Sn is equal to M. Because remember we were assuming that the limit as X approaches C of the function f of X is equal to L and now we are taking a sequence that is converging to C so as it gets really, really close to C, the outputs are going to have to get really, really close to L. So the limit of this sequence, remember this is a sequence of functional values, will be L, and this limit will be M. But, what then is going to be the limit as X, sorry, the limit is as we go towards infinity, because we're in sequences now, the limit of the product function on the SNs, well, by definition of product of functions, this would be the limit of f sn multiplied by g sn. But then by all the work that we did in chapter 4 over the past practically month of the class, I can now say that this is just the limit of f sn multiplied by the limit of g sn because we did all of that work in the last unit to say that sequences worked well with products. But that's just L multiplied by M. So that's exactly what I needed. We have the limit of F G S N goes to or is equal to L M. So by big theorem, remember big theorem was an if and only if, so not only do I get to take a sequence and play with the sequence, but now even though I proved this about a sequence, we now get to conclude that the limit as x approaches c of f of x g of x is equal to l m as needed. Gorgeous, great theorem. Okay, so what's our classic first semester calculus problem that we've seen a billion times? Well, in first semester calculus, what is the limit of this product here? Sorry, of this quotient? Well, 4x squared minus 9. Notice you can't do a quotient to this technically right off the bat because the denominator would be 
zero if I plugged in x over three halves. But four x squared minus nine over two x minus three is certainly equal to two x plus three, two x minus three, all over two x minus three, which is equal to two x plus three, four, all x not equal to three halves. Right? The only one that messes it up is three halves. But because of those facts now, the facts that are true thanks to the sequences from the limits, or the limit, uh, the, the sequence, uh, thanks to the big theorem that connects sequences and limits of functions, we can now say so the limit as x approaches three halves of 4x squared minus 9 over 2x minus 3 is just simply equal to the limit as x approaches 3 halves of 2x plus 3 because we're just, we can just imagine a sequence that goes towards 3 halves without hitting 3 halves and if we're not hitting 3 halves then we get to simplify into this expression with no concern about the domain then all of those limit facts allow us to say that this is two times the limit as x approaches three halves of x plus the limit as x approaches three halves of three. And actually today in this lecture we proved that this would be two times limit as x approaches three halves of x is just c in that proof, right? We did it for any constant, but here it's three halves. And this right here is literally a constant function. So this wasn't this was the identity function. This one's the constant function, and that's just three. So you get three plus three, which is also known as six. So all of those limit theorems that you do with the five A students now, this is the full formal justification. It was a a lot more complicated than we let on when we do it in a calculus course. The actual technicalities are are deep. Okay, so as a quick note, uh, a minor tweak to our initial definition. Remember, our initial definition was essentially plus or minus delta. We could go left or right. But we can modify that definition to make a left-handed limit and a right-handed limit make sense. And the way you would modify it and the way that you would use them would be just aligned with your Math 5A understanding that you've already done. Okay, so for Thursday, please try to do problems 1, 4, 7, 16, 18, and 19. 1, 4, and 7 are more about uh, calculation of limits with some justification, and then 16, 18, 19 are more formal proofs. Thank you.